Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Kilvington, and this is an audio and video log that journeys through comic book history as I discuss individual comic book stories of Star Trek, the Justice Society, and the world's greatest superheroes, the Justice League of America. Justice Trek is the only show devoted to the entirety of these great comic book series. From the 1940 debut of the JSA, the launch of the JLA and Star Trek comic books in the 1960s, and right up to comics hot off today's shelves. This show will impact you in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Hey, I'm Ted Kilvington. Welcome to Justice Trek. Thanks for stopping by. Today is episode seven, where I will be covering not one, but two classic stories from one from the Golden Age of Comics, one from the Bronze Age of Comics, both of which feature neither Justice Society, nor Justice League, nor Star Trek. What I am doing, what I am going to be talking about is Black Hawk. Now, I don't mean the Black Hawk hockey team or the Black Hawk helicopters or Black Hawk County, Iowa. I'm going to be talking about the team of freelance freedom fighter pilots who fought the Nazis during World War II and stayed together as adventurers for a couple decades afterwards. Uh, they were originally published from uh, Quality Comics uh, beginning in 1941, uh, and they were fighting the Nazis even before the U.S. got involved in World War II. Uh, and the first run of their comics, uh, when Quality Comics ended, DC bought the uh, company um, and rights to all the characters. So then DC kept publishing Blackhawk comics up until 1968. Uh, so uh, it was the only, they were the only characters outside of um, Superman, Batman, Robin, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, Green Arrow, and Aquaman to be published continuously from the 40s through the 60s. And Green Arrow and Aquaman didn't even have their own comic. They were just uh, side features in adventure comics. So the only four characters that actually had their own self-titled uh, series from the 40s through the 60s were Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Black Hawk. And of those four, only one of those was published every single month. And that was Black Hawk. At that time, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, their own regular comics with their known names, were only published once every six weeks. But Black Hawk was every month. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, like I said, they were the only comic character to have their own self-titled series published every month throughout the 1950s. The only one to appear every month. But that's not exactly why I'm talking about them here today. Uh, as you may have heard, uh, there are a group of uh, comic book podcasters that do kind of a, a podcast uh, crossover event, if you will, every uh, May and May of every year. Uh, and it started out, they were talking about uh, Justice League. So they uh, started to call the crossover event, the annual event, J.L. May. So J.L. May... Uh, this year, we'll be talking about the uh, years uh, 2000 through 2010 um, monthly series of The Brave and the Bold, uh, which uh, started out being published by uh, DC uh, with writers, writer Mark Wade and artist uh, George Perez, and um, continued on for a couple years afterwards, and they brought on different writers and artists, but it had a wide variety of characters throughout uh, the DC Comics history. And in the issue that I'm gonna be talking about for the JL May podcast crossover event this year is issue number nine, The Brave and the Bold number nine from, uh, 19, or from 2007. And there actually are many, many characters in that issue but the very first one to be name-checked is the Blackhawks. They're right there on the cover in the upper left side. You know, you've got your Blackhawk right there. And um, yeah, 
I've loved the Blackhawks ever since uh, I was a kid. Now, I liked them when I first read a couple of their stories in the 70s, but it wasn't until uh, the uh, Mark Evanier, uh, Dan Spiegel run of Blackhawk comics uh, in the uh, 1980s that really cemented my love for the characters. Uh, and uh, um, so when they asked me to pick which comic I wanted for the crossover event, I'm, well, I want the one with Blackhawk. So uh, they said, sure, it's yours. And But before I talk about that, in our next episode, I thought perhaps I, w I should share my love of Blackhawk with you and perhaps familiarize you with the character I say it like that characters is Blackhawk was the name of the leader of the group of freelance freedom fighter pilots. However, the name of the, the group was Blackhawks, plural. So you have Blackhawk the leader and Blackhawks the group. Sometimes, just to make it clear, I'll refer to the Blackhawk squadron, so it includes the whole uh, group of fighter pilots. And uh, Personally, I was in the U.S. Air Force for four years and during the 1980s, so I know all about squadrons. So uh, that's why I'm wearing this Air Force hoodie instead of a comic book hoodie, is because I'm trying to think of something I own that I could thematically tie in with Blackhawks. And so and I was like, well, I'll wear, you know, they, they were a squadron, so I'll wear something re representing my military days. So uh, the two Blackhawk stories I'm going to talk about today are the very first Blackhawk comic from Military Comics Number no. 1, published in 1941, and a special story from 1980 where the Blackhawks team up with Batman from that year's The Brave and the Bold number no. 167. Uh, now, the first time I ever read any Blackhawk story it actually was the very first Blackhawk story when it was reprinted in 1973's Secret Origins number no. 6. Now, Secret Origins, uh, for those of you who don't know, is an anthology series published by DC Comics in the early 1970s, with each issue reprinting the origin story of I, at least one DC hero or villain. Uh, it, I didn't even realize at the time that that actually was the very first, because not all origin stories are first stories. A lot of times they are, but not always. Um, but uh, um, I'll talk more about the, how I felt about that story at the time after I uh, read you the story synopsis. Um, but probably the next time I ever read the characters, the Blackhawks, was in their uh, appearance in 1980 when they met Batman. So not only are these two great uh, stories, these are also happened to be the very first two Blackhawk stories I ever read. Now, I had uh, read a little bit more about them. Um, in the late 70s uh, or early 80s, um, I would go to like garage sales and I would pick up copies of old uh, Mad Magazine paperbacks. And one of the paperbacks had a reprint of the Blackhawk parody that was done back when Mad Magazine wasn't even a magazine, back when it was a comic. And they called it Black and Blue Hawks. Uh, I'd also, um, in the early 80s, um, gotten a hold of uh, Jim Steranko's History of Comics, which was kind of uh, like a series of articles talking about early comic book history. And it was the um, uh, article on the Blackhawks that really intrigued me and made me want to learn more about these characters. And then in 1982, when the Mark Evanier Dan Spiegel uh, a run came in. Uh, I, I tried it out and really, really uh, just loved it. Loved it. Loved it. I've reread it a couple times. And uh, if you haven't read it, by all means, go out and read it. Great comics, folks. Gr they are great comics. True story. Artist Dan Spiegel drew most of the Mark Evanier run of Blackhawk in the early 80s. Uh, then afterwards, uh, Dan Spiegel and Mark Evanier, uh, they'd had many collaborations before Blackhawk, and they had many collaborations after Blackhawk. Um, and um, I wanted to talk about Bla Blackhawk um, on my previous podcast, the audio-only podcast of Justice Trek that I was doing a few years ago. So before I talked about Blackhawk, I thought I should maybe read up on the character and read up on the creators. So I went to the uh, Tomorrow's Publishing website, publisher of many fine books about comic books, 
And while there, I got a copy of Dan Spiegel, A Life in Comic Art. Uh, it's a great read. Uh, if you love Dan Spiegel, you owe it to yourself to pick this up. But here's the true story. This was a few years ago when I got this. It was delivered to my house within an hour of Dan Spiegel's passing. Uh oh, how's that for, for weirdness? <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, also, uh, we have previous episodes for you, uh, for your listening and viewing pleasure. Uh, episode one, we covered uh, the first meeting of Superman and the original Captain Marvel Shazam from 1976's JLA number 137. Second episode, we covered the very first expanded universe Star Trek story from 1967 Star Trek number one from Gold Key Comics, the very first original Star Trek story outside of the original TV series. Episode three, covered the very first appearance of the Justice Society of America from 1940's All-Star Comics number three. Episode four, I covered Marvel Comics Star Trek number one from 1980, the first part of the adaptation of Star Trek the Motion Picture. Episode five, I covered the very first appearance of the Justice League of America from 1959's The Brave and the Bold number 28. And in episode six, I covered Marvel Star Trek number two and number three from 1980 with the second and third, and which was the final part of their adaptation of Star Trek The Motion Picture. They're all out there on YouTube for you to enjoy, and I hope you uh, do. Uh, just if you like this episode, if you like any of the episodes, click like, click subscribe. Uh, let's see. Now, for, I'm going to talk about the first Black Hawk story, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about uh, the other Black Hawk story. Um, just a, a little refresher of uh, what's going on. Since this, is, since this is the very first Black Hawk story ever, uh, all characters appearing in the story are making their first appearance, and they were all created by the writer and artist of the story. Uh, the Blackhawks, uh, well, I've already described them enough. Um, we'll, you'll learn more as, as we go on. Uh, so Military Comics number 1 was published uh, May 2nd, 1941 by Quality Comics with an August cover date and a 10 cent cover price. Uh, the original 11 page story of that in that first issue was by uh was un untitled and it was written by will eisner the great will eisner yes the same guy who created the spirit uh created blackhawk uh there are the uh, pencil and ink artist uh, that's my kitten uh if you've watched any previous episodes she gets jealous of you. She gets jealous of the attention I'm paying to you. So she frequently will make an appearance on the show trying to get my attention. She acts like she doesn't want to be on the show, but she continually intrudes on the show. But, hey, she's a kitten. What do you expect? Anywho, <laughs> the original story, untitled, 11 pages, by Will Eisner writer Chuck Kudera, pencil and ink artist, and Gilbert Fox, editor. Okay, my kitten decided she wanted to make an appearance after all. So, using my announcer voice, History has proven that whenever liberty is smothered and men lie crushed beneath oppression, there always rises a man to defend the helpless, liberate the enslaved, and crush the tyrant. Such a man is Black Hawk. Out of the ruins of Europe and out of the hopeless mass of defeated people, he comes smashing evil before him. In September 1939, in the European country of Poland, the powerful armies of Nazi Germany were on the march on the land in the German air force known as the Luftwaffe commanded the Polish skies. All were under the command of General von Tepp. Von Tepp's butcher squadron dropped bombs over the city of Warsaw, destroying and killing much of the city. 
But one superior Polish pilot in a black plane managed to shoot down many of the German bombers. The Polish pilot landed and went to his home to check on his family, only to find it demolished and his brother and sister killed. As the months passed by, the Polish pilot, now known as Black Hawk, seeks revenge against Captain Von Tepp. Meanwhile, in France, Von Tepp orders a local nurse to tell him where to find medical supplies, and when she refuses, Von Tepp orders her to be shot along with other prisoners. As they are lined up against a wall, the execution squad is about to fire when they hear the song of the Black Hawks. Black Hawk himself walks onto the scene and orders all of the Nazis to hand over their weapons. The members of the Black Hawk squadron surround the Nazis, free the prisoners, and then capture Von Tepp and take him, along with the now liberated nurse, back to the team's headquarters on Black Hawk Island. When they arrive at the island, Black Hawk orders Von Tepp to choose one of two planes so they can fight an aerial duel so that Black Hawk may have his revenge. Von Tepp examines both planes chooses one, and then the two men take off and begin their dogfight. Blackhawk soon notices that Von Tepp had opened the fuel compartment on his plane, and out of desperation, he crashes his plane into Von Tepp's, sending both planes hurtling to the ground. Both men manage to escape the wreckage and then face each other on the ground on Blackhawk Island. They both draw pistols, but Blackhawk manages to kill Von Tepp. The nurse, attend <clears throat> the nurse attends to Black Hawk before she is returned to the mainland, and the story ends with the words, As the plane fades into the deep glow of the sunset, Black Hawk turns once again to the task destiny has allotted him. Um, so, as, as I said, I first read this story uh, in the 70s when it was given to me. Um, you know, my dad gave me a, a big stack of comics uh, that he got from a co-worker, and among them was Secret Origins number six. Uh, in addition to Black Hawk, uh, the story, uh, or the issue, also featured the origin of the Legion of Superheroes, reprinted from 1968's Superboy number 147. And it had that Black Hawk story from Military Comics number one. Uh, the second time I read that particular story uh, was in 1989, when it was reprinted in uh, that year's Black Hawk number no. 7. The third time I read the story was when it was reprinted in the year 2000's Millennium Edition Military Comics. And then I also read the story when it was reprinted in the Black Hawk Archives, published in 2001. And, of course, I read the story just now as I was preparing for this podcast. The cover art is by Will Eisner and Gilbert Fox. The cover image shows Black Hawk standing on a tank, punching the shoulder, shoulder, punching the soldier coming out of the top. Uh, we can also see the face of the tank driver through the tank's front window. We can see th the, that the tank seems to be moving through barbed wire, and the whole image is set against a yellow background. The cover copy along the top says the book has stories of the Army and Navy, so it's interesting that the book's most popular feature was basically a paramilitary air force. Uh, the cover copy says starring that new comic sensation Black Hawk and two books in one. Because apparently the first half of the book uh, is the Army section and the second half of the book is the Navy section, although there were just as many stories about pilots in both sections. Of course, the U.S. Navy certainly has a large share of uh, uh, pilots. Um, the Department of the Navy, so Navy and uh, Marines combined actually have more planes than the U.S. Air Force. But the U.S. Air Force has more than either one of them individually. At least when I was in the Air Force, the Air Force had more pl 
uh, planes and the other branch, but the Navy and Marines combined had more. I don't even know about the Army, but I know they didn't have as much as the Air Force or the Navy. They may have had more than the Marines, but I digress. Um, now, this cover looks like Will Eisner to me. Even before I looked up the cr cover credits, I, could, I said, hey, that looks like Will Eisner uh, drawing there, and I was right. Uh, so, and this, of course, was 1941. Uh, so it's interesting that his style, which would become so uh, strong later in the decade, um, and, of course, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s, because he was drawing comics for that many years, uh, his style was er developed enough by 1941 that I could easily recognize it. Um, the credits also say that Gilbert Fox, the editor of the book, also contributed to the cover art. But I don't know, I'm, I'm not at all aware of Gilbert Fox's art style. I can't tell you what, if anything, he actually did contribute to the cover. Um, the other features in the book, Military Comics number one, uh, there were uh, Loops and Banks, which was a, about a couple of uh, U.S. Marine pilots in China. Uh, the Blue Tracer, uh, which was about an American engineer who designs a fan fantastic flying bullet tank to fight the Italian army in Ethiopia. Uh, there's a strip about uh, Archie Atkins, about three British soldiers fighting the Italian army in Libya. And since uh, I don't even know if the character Archie Andrews had appeared um, by this point, he, he may have, I think he, I'm pretty sure he appeared in the summer of 41. So it was around the same time. So Archie Andrews had nothing to do with Archie Atkins. The, just a coincidence that the names were alike. Uh, there was a uh, shot and shell a feature about a young man and an eccentric uh, veteran of the both the Spanish American and World War One. Um, and uh, the, then the other one is a, just a teenager. So you've got uh, the young man, teen, the teenager and the uh, the old, old veteran because the Spanish American War was 1898. So by 1941, he'd, uh, that was 43 years afterwards. My cat is really feeling her oats. Yes, princess, you will get attention, I promise. Um, another feature, Yankee Eagle, about the crew of the USS America who fight Nazis in the South Atlantic Ocean. There was Death Patrol, about a freelance foreign legion of sorts that fight Nazis. But unlike the Blackhawks, these guys are not pilots. The first strip is drawn by Plastic Man creator Jack Cole. So it definitely has an interesting uh, look. I mean, the visuals, uh, aside from perhaps the Blackhawk story, uh, Death, Death Patrol would be the most striking uh, art-wise of, of any of the features in the book. In fact, for my brothers, I'd say Jack Cole uh, was even more distinctive than Chuck Kudera. Nothing against Chuck Kudera. But uh, Jack Cole's work, um, as any of his fans will tell you, it's, it's on another level. Uh, another feature, Miss America. Now, she's not a, really a superhero, at least not in this first story. Um, but after DC decided uh, in 1985 that uh, there was no Wonder Woman in World War II, even though they, DC'd been publishing uh, comics of Wonder Woman from her first appearance in 1941 all the way up to the present, they said, no. Or they're just a contemporary Wonder Woman. Um, there never was one around at that time. So writer Roy Thomas uh, took the this character, Miss America, and rewrote superhero history, DC comic superhero history in the 1940s to say that the uh, character that appeared in all those adventures with the Justice Society and the All-Star Squadron were actually Miss America, not Wonder Woman. Uh, Miss America is reporter Joan Dale, and she fights saboteurs on the U.S. home front. And the final feature, in, which is, of course is in the Navy section, is Q-Boat, about an old sailor and three young British lads who have a military superboat that is disguised as a schooner, and it fights the Nazi Navy. So, um, on the first page, um, you know, Blackhawk was the first feature, and so you, you open the cover, and there's the Blackhawk story. Um, all it really shows on this page is Blackhawk in his black leather uniform, complete with his uh, genres. Um When I first saw this image at eight years old, 
1976, I found it terrifying. I knew even then about the Nazi SS officers. And to me, that's what Black Hawk looked like. He looked like a Nazi SS officer. Uh, his uniform in this image did not have the big uh, Hawk logo on his uh, torso that he would have in later years. Um, next, uh, Von Tepp makes his appearance. Uh, and although he actually dies in this story, there would be several other characters in future Black Hawk stories that would also be named Von Tepp. Uh, page three, uh, although we see Black Hawk's black plane, he has not yet adopted the black uniform. Uh, his brother and sister are named as Jack and Connie, and those are definitely not Polish names. Uh, you know, that's one of the things in the uh, Howard Chaikin revival of Black Hawk in 1987. Um, it kind of evolved that Black Hawk was not full Polish, or rather he had like dual Polish-American citizenship. And starting with the Chaikin version, he was just Polish. And that the, uh, the American part was just uh, something they said uh, to get American people sy sympathetic with his cause, and they would contribute money uh, for his team of uh, uh, freedom fighter pilots. On page four, a uh, few months uh, later, because the Nazi invasion took place in September of 39, uh, and then now we're in the summer of 40, four, 41. So that's a, about a year and a half later that we're at now. And we don't ever get shown how Black Hawk went from day one of, of the war with the Nazi invasion of Poland to become that feared uh, squadron leader a um, year and a half later. We don't see that. In fact, I don't think we've ever seen that. It goes straight from, uh, hey, um, there's this dude who has a, a flying a plane in Poland and he's really good at shooting down Nazi planes. Uh, that's the you know, beginning of the war. And next thing we know, this dude has his own squadron of planes and all these fighter pilots and uniforms in a private island. We don't get to see how any of that came about, ever. If I were ever uh, uh, given the chance to write a Black Hawk comic, that is the story I would tell. How he went from one dude with a plane to commanding his own squadron with a private island. On page five, uh, the nurse that stands up to the Nazi is accompanied by soldier prisoners. Uh, it's not actually specified to which army those soldiers belong. It, it might, probably French, because they said you know, the story did say that they were in France. But, of course, a lot of nations were fighting together at that time. <laughs> page six, the Black Hawk song. Right from the first half of the very first Black Hawk story. I would have thought that's something that would evolve over time, but no, it was always intended from you know very first story that this group of paramilitary freedom fighters has their own theme song. Do you really want my attention that badly? <sighs> so, um, on page seven, one of Black Hawk's men uh, speaks with a British accent which is odd given that it was never said that there were any British members of the squadron. Uh, certainly, I don't think there were any named British members of the Black Hawk squadron. Uh, page eight, uh, Black Hawk Island, as I mentioned in the synopsis, also appears in this very first story. Now, on this page, for some insane reason, uh, Black Hawk wanted to bring prisoner Von Tepp back to his own island so he could kill them in an aerial duel. So, dude, why would you take the chance that this Nazi officer could escape with the location of your secret airbase by giving him a plane? Why would you give this guy a plane? I mean, at the very least, he might, you know, if he shot you down, if he shot you, then he would just fly off with the plane and tell all the Nazis where your, the other pilots were. Insane. On page nine, um, on this page, we get you, they use uh, the term to some aerial maneuvers. Uh, page 10, uh, this page uses some terms of uh, airplanes, mechanical uh, terms. And, and I don't ever recall hearing the term petcock uh, outside of the context of this story. Uh, I was, as I said, I was in the Air Force. I uh, was a medic, so I didn't spend a lot of time around planes, but I did uh, see some a little. And uh, I don't recall hearing anyone call 
uh, the fighter jets that uh, I was around uh, using the term petcock. Maybe, maybe they did. I don't know. And on page 11, it, of course, Blackhawk does kill Von Tepp, uh, as chivalry would have it, although chivalry only works when both sides use it, and the Nazis did not fight according to those rules. So, um, it's an interesting concept. I can see why it would intrigue uh, people, uh, kids, uh, young readers just before uh, World War II broke out. You know, uh, uh, Will Eisner said that, uh, he, you know, he was Jewish. He had new Jews. He knew of the Nazi threat to not just to the other countries in Europe, but to Jews specifically. Uh, I don't think in 1941 that there were uh, the Nazis were uh, had yet started their genocidal plan of the gas chambers. Uh, certainly, however, they were rounding up uh, the Jews and putting them in the uh, concentration camps. So, uh, but still, it, you know, Eisner wanted to do his part to promote the menace of the Nazis, say, hey, America, we need to worry about these guys. And, um, you know, he was ahead of his time. Uh, other than that, it was great to see some of the concepts were there from the beginning, you know, the Blackhawks, the squadron, the planes, the uniforms, the theme song, uh, the, the private island headquarters. Um, it just would have been interesting to me to kind of see how it progressed from, you know, that first uh, uh, battle um, on uh, September 1st, 1939. So uh, I've read the story many times, read it as a kid, uh, you know, just when I was about... Yay, hi. Uh, yes, and when, I, when I was, you know, uh, tw 21 inches tall, when I, would, I was reading Black Hawk comics, sure. Uh, okay. Um, so if you like the Black Hawks, click like, click, click subscribe. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the credits, and then we'll come back here, and I'll tell you about 1980's The Brave and the Bold, number 167, with Black Hawk and Batman. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter under the handle at Justice Trek or via email at thejusticetrek at gmail.com. Be sure to include the word the at the beginning of the email address. For research purposes, I rely heavily on dc.fandom.com, memory-alpha.fandom.com, comicvine.gamespot.com, Grand Comics Database at comics.org, and Mike Boyle's website, Mike's Amazing World of DC Comics at dcindexes.com. The opinions expressed are solely those of the host and any participants. This podcast is not a commercial enterprise and does not make any money. All copyrights are held by their respective owners. The opening sequence was animated by Craig Smith of Phoenix Studios. The opening music is Dragon Slayer by the Mackay Symphony. The closing music pieces are the Superman theme, composed by John Williams, and the Star Trek theme from the original series, composed by Alexander Courage. Both closing songs are performed by the Superhero Orchestra. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Hey folks, welcome back. Uh, I told the, I promised the kitten I would pay her more attention, so here I am. Don't chew on my strings. She has, and certainly don't chew on the microphone. Okay, um, The Brave and the Bull number 167 uh, was, or excuse me, before we get into that particular issue, The Brave and the Bold was a comic series that began in 1955 by D, from DC, and at first... Uh, it starred a variety of adventure characters, um, and then after a few years, it switched into being more of a showcase 
style book where each issue would showcase a different uh, character or group. Uh, and then after a few more years, it uh, kind of uh, morphed into uh, a, a team up comic where each issue would feature a team up of uh, two or more different DC characters. And then it kind of morphed into a, a Batman team up comic where one of the characters that teamed up in the issue was always Batman. Uh, let's see. Now, uh, in the late 70s, uh, no, throughout the 70s, when Batman appeared, and even in the late 60s, maybe, um, Batman did team up with some of DC's uh, World War II uh, characters. So, for example, you, there were many team ups between Batman and the World War II uh, American soldier, Sergeant Rock. And they never really said in those stories. It was never specifically said, you know, which Earth it was. And that was the thing of all the, the Brave and the Bold stories written by writer Bob Haney is a lot of times they said all of his stories appeared on a world of his own because a lot of them just didn't bother following the, the history of characters uh, from their own uh, stories or even other sometimes even stories he had written. Uh, for example, in one story, Bob Haney uh, said, oh, by the way, here's Batman's brother. Now, anyone who, almost everyone on the planet knows Batman and knows Batman does not have a brother. I mean, we all know the story of how Batman, as his uh, young Bruce Wayne, was walking with his parents uh, and his, they were gunned down and shot and killed in front of him. And then he swore to become uh, a crime fighter to avenge their deaths. And he, we, we saw him you know, go through his schooling and his uh, fighting training and all that. Never did we see him ever mention a sibling. So that was the type of thing that had happened in The Brave and the Bold. Um, eventually, though, it was decided that um, as the 80s were approaching, if Batman were going to team up with World War II characters, it couldn't be the same Batman because, uh, you know, it's 40 years have gone by. This, the guy appearing in Batman comics in 1980 uh, was, did not fight in World War II. Uh, they decided then that all of the uh, stories in which Batman was meeting World War II characters would therefore be using the Batman of Earth 2, uh, who did, it was established, did have uh, World War II era adventures. You know, supposedly this was the original Batman. The Earth 2 Batman was the original Batman who first appeared in 1939 and appeared all throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s. I have to give her my kitten little puffs of air to kind of gently remind her not to chew on certain things. So by 1980, um, it was decided that uh, this would be the um, Earth 2 Blackhawk or Golden Age Blackhawk uh, that was teaming up with the World War II era Blackhawks. Uh, let's see... Now, in that first Blackhawk story that we read uh, before the break and talked about, um, they never actually mentioned the names of any of the individual members of the Blackhawk Squadron. However, in this story, in The Brave and the Bold, number 167, they actually name-check each and every member of the Blackhawk team on the very first page. The Brave and the Bold, number 167, was published July 24th, 1980, with an October cover date and a 50-cent cover price. The story was titled Ice Station Alpha, 17 pages by Marv Wolfman writer, Dan, or Dave Cockrum, pencil artist, Dan Adkins, ink artist, Ben Oda, letterer, Adrian Roy, colorist, and Paul Levitz, editor. Um, let's set the scene with Marv Wolfman's own words of introduction. Again, using my announcer voice. Orphaned as a child when he watched his parents killed, young Bruce Wayne grew to maturity with vengeance burning in his heart. Through discipline and dedication and training, he became the original Dark Knight detective, Batman. The Seven Wonders of the World, Chuck, Texas gunfighter, Andre, French fighter, Olaf, Swedish acrobat, Stanislaus, Polish muscle man, Hendrickson, German marksman, and Chop Chop, Oriental warrior, 
all led by the greatest of them all, Black Hawk. September 19th, 1944, 12 midnight, German prognosis. In the next two days, Gotham City and all of the American Eastern Seaboard will face total destruction. This is the story of those 48 crucial hours. Batman observes a group of five disguised Nazi saboteurs steal laboratory equipment from a Gotham City warehouse and load it into a truck. Batman confronts the Germans, but they are able to hold him off with gunfire and a grenade as they make their escape. Meanwhile, the Black Hawks successfully attack a Nazi blockade in Poland, and afterwards they learn about an Allied agent who is investigating a threat to America called Ice Station Alpha. They take off in their planes and fly to the Sahara Desert, and as they fly overhead they see the missing Allied agent frozen solid in a block of ice in the middle of the desert. In Gotham City, Commissioner Gordon contacts Batman and informs him that the federal government just ordered the Gotham PD to stop investigating the theft of scientific laboratory equipment. Batman, however, is not a member of the Gotham PD. He then flies off to Washington, D.C. in the Bat Plane. In the North African country of Tunisia, the Blackhawks learn more information about what the Allied agent was investigating, and then they fly back to Europe to talk to General Dwight Eisenhower at the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. The future president tells the Blackhawks all he knows about Ice Station Alpha. In Washington, Batman, in his identity of Bruce Wayne, asks government bureaucrats about the laboratory thefts, uh, saying that he owns stocks in those companies and he deserves more information. Denied information by federal government bureaucrats, Bruce goes undercover as Batman to investigate top-secret files related to the thefts. Returning to Gotham City, a giant Nazi flying machine emerges from Gotham Bay and creates a tidal wave which floods the docks, killing three people. Knowing that it is now even more imperative to investigate Nazi activity in Gotham City, Batman remembers that one of the saboteurs he had encountered earlier was German boxing champ Joseph Kranz, and that Kranz was fighting that night at Gotham Sports Arena. Batman travels to the arena and in mid-fight leaps into the ring in front of thousands of witnesses and starts pummeling the heavyweight champion for information. In Austria, the Blackhawks learn the location of Ice Station Alpha. In the Arctic Circle, at Ice Station Alpha, a Nazi general tells an underling about how their weapon will melt the polar ice cap, converting the water to steam, take it to the American East Coast, convert the steam back into water, and submerge all of America's East Coast cities. Soon, the Blackhawks arrive at Ice Station Alpha and strafe the Nazi ice station with the bullets while dodging a German anti-aircraft gun. The plane belonging to the Blackhawk known as Olaf is hit, so Olaf ejects himself, but is about to fall into the path of a Nazi ice ray when he is rescued in midair by the just-arrived Batman in his bat plane. The Blackhawks do as much damage to the ice station as they can with the guns on their planes, and then they land uh, and Batman lands to take the fight inside the station. They reach the Nazi general, who is about to activate the device that will kill hundreds of towns and cities and millions of Americans. Before the Nazi can pull the lever to activate his device, the Black Hawk, known as Chop Chop, throws an axe at the man, which distracts him long enough for Batman to knock the general unconscious. One of the scientists tells Batman that the general had primed the device too early, and thus the device was building up to a massive explosion. Batman and the Blackhawks return to their planes and manage to fly away just before the destruction. As the heroes fly to their respective homes, the Blackhawks open up by singing their song. The end. The cover art to this issue uh, is by Jim Aparo, longtime Brave and Bold artist. Uh, The image shows what looks like Blackhawk in his plane making a kamikaze dive at Ice Station Alpha, while Batman stands on the wing of the plane. At the same time, all of the other members of the Blackhawk Squadron are also making kamikaze dives. 
Um, it's always a treat to see artist Jim Aparo handle all the multiple characters of the extended DC universe. Uh, to a lot of fans of my generation, Jim Aparo was the Batman artist. There were lots of great Batman artists, so don't get me wrong, but it, um, certainly after Neil Adams stopped working regularly on the character in the early 70s, uh, I, for, for us, it, it just seems like Jim Aparo was the, the most reliable consistent artist, Batman artist on the book. And it was his uh, style that, that my uh, era of comic fans thinks of when they think of Blackhawk. Or <laughs> when they think of Batman. Nobody thinks of Jim Apparel in Blackhawk. Indeed. I think this one uh, cover image here is the only time Jim Apparel ever drew Blackhawk. Um, let's see. Now, this issue also contains an eight-page story uh, with the uh, character Nemesis. The story was written by Carrie Briquette and the art was by Dan Spiegel. Uh, it's interesting how this was the first Blackhawk comic uh, published in 1980. And although it had Dan Spiegel art, uh, the Blackhawk series uh, that was biggest in the first half of the 1980s, the Mark Evanier run, also had Dan Spiegel art. So you can't have a Blackhawk comic in the early 80s without Dan Spiegel, I guess, even if he's not drawing that particular story. Uh, let's see, page one is the splash page uh, with end credit page. Um, the story begins right here. Uh, Dave Cockrum draws the Golden Age Batman's cowl with bat ears that look more like devil horns. And I love uh, Marv Wolfman's captions on this page. Uh, page two, a Nazi refers to Batman as Ein Flatterbossmann. Uh, Fledermaus is literally German for flying mouse, um, and uh, I've heard it said that bats aren't actually rodents, but uh, I think at the very least, bats are more similar to rodents than they are to birds, which, you know, take that for what you will. Um, and, and, you know, Cockrum really does some great fighting action on the second page. You know, he's, uh, the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, he, Cockrum really excels at. Uh, on page three, I love the bit where a Nazi throws a German grenade with a handle on it. They call it a potato masher. Batman catches the grenade and throws it back before it explodes. Uh, we also have a bit here where the Blackhawks are dropping leaflets over Warsaw, warning the citizens to get off the streets in advance of their upcoming street battle with the Nazis. Uh, so in case you're wondering how is it that uh, uh, they can avoid... Uh, non-combatant casualties, well, they, they give warnings, which unfortunately doesn't always uh, help them with the Nazis. Uh, on page four, uh, we have a big panel uh, showing the Blackhawks uh, and, you know, fighting the Nazis on the streets of Warsaw. Um, now, on this page, we first see the team's Chinese member, uh, who was only called Chop Chop at that time, wearing his Chinese clothes. Uh, the character of Chop Chop had worn Chinese clothes instead of a black leather Blackhawk uniform from his very first appearance in World War II until 1964's Blackhawk number 197, when all seven members started wearing the new red and black cloth uniforms. Uh, in the 1976 Blackhawk run, the character had his name updated to the less racist Chopper, uh, in 1977's Justice League of America, number 144, in a flashback sequence set in the late 1950s, all Blackhawks were shown wearing the same outfits they wore at that time, so Chop Chop was back to being depicted wearing uh, Chinese clothes. Um, and he continued wearing the Chinese clothes in every appearance from 1977 through 1983. It was about halfway through the Mark Evanier run when he decided that, no, Chop Chop was supposed, should be a full member of the team, and he should wear the uniform. Uh, now, the name that um, Mark Evanier gave to uh, Chop Chop, this, the civilian name, uh, was Wu Chang. However, a couple years later, when Howard Chaikin would do his version of Blackhawk, he did have the character wear his leather uh, Blackhawk uniform in, during World War II. However, he also renamed the, the civilian identity Wang Chan. I don't know why he would go from Wu Chang to Wang Chan, but for whatever reason, uh, that's how Chaikin chose to do it. Uh, page five. 
As the Blackhawks finish off the Nazis, we see some fist fighting. A lot of the Blackhawk stories have fist fights, but I doubt many real Nazis were defeated by fists. Uh, at the bottom of this page, the pilots look down from their planes and see Agent Carmichael frozen in a block of ice in the middle of the desert. A, that's a very big stretch here because how would a person identify what or who is even inside a block of ice from the altitude of a plane? Uh, page six, we have a nice bit of uh, Batman and Commissioner Gordon interaction. If not for the mention of uh, President Franklin Roosevelt and uh, the longer bat ears on Batman, this page could have easily taken place in what was then the present 1980. Um, the art on this page looks like Dave Cockerman is being influenced by classic 1950s Batman artist Dick Sprang. Uh, on page 7, we get a brief appearance by Dick Grayson and uh, Alfred. Uh, we see the 1940s version of the Bat plane. Uh, now that has the special vertical launching uh, pad and exit through an old barn near uh, stately Wayne Manor. Uh, we also see the romantic uh, French Black Hawk Andre flirting with a local woman. Uh, on page eight, now we aren't actually told that the uh, American general that the Black Hawks are talking to is Dwight Eisenhower. No name is mentioned, but we are told is they're talking with a real higher up at uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. And in the real world, at the time of the story, the Supreme Commander of that force was General Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, and the character, you know, in the drawing, to, to me at least, looks like uh, how General Eisenhower did look in 1944. Uh, page nine. Bruce Wayne has a pipe in his mouth when he is talking to the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. Now, I haven't read a lot of Golden Age uh, Batman stories, but Bruce Wayne did indeed smoke a pipe on the very first page of his very first appearance in 1939's Detective Comics number 27. Page 10. Um, there is a, or here is where we see the big Nazi flying submersible machine in Gotham Bay. And I'm sorry, I got to call BS on this bit because if the Nazis have the technology to secretly deploy such fantastically powerful technology, uh, these weapons that close to a U.S. city, undetected, if they had that, they easily would have won the war. Uh, page 11, there's a panel on this page of a uh, of average Gotham City family listening to a boxing match on the radio. The kid asks his dad if they can listen to The Shadow instead, which I thought was a, a good touch. A lot of the uh, comic uh, fandom of uh, the 1970s and you know 1980, uh, when this issue came out, were really big into uh, The Shadow. Um, page 12. I love the bit where Batman leaps into the boxing ring in front of the fans and starts beating the crap out of the German fighter. Like, oh, you think you're talking to uh, you, fighting another professional fighter is tough? Well, wait till you fight Batman. <laughs> uh, on page 13, um, Ice Station Alpha looks like a giant military fortress, but made out of ice. Uh, the title of this story and the station was inspired by the 1963 novel and 1968 film Ice Station Zebra. Although I, I checked and the plots of this story and the, that film and novel have almost nothing to do with each other. I mean, yeah, they're in what the, the, the movie and novel aren't even during World War II. Uh, page 14, um, I love this bit where Batman retracts the top of the bat plane cockpit so Olaf can parachute uh, right into it. Now, the character of Olaf uh, always talks with his uh, stereotypical Swedish accent. So here he says, Batman, I surely didn't expect you here. And then when Batman replies, oh, well, you must be Olaf, or you must be Olaf. Um, Olaf replies, you bound be sure of that, pie, you mini. Uh, on page 15, we finally get to see the Blackhawks in aerial action. We'd seen the Blackhawks earlier in the story, but they weren't actually um, fighting when they were flying. They were fighting on the ground or flying in the air, but not doing both. Finally, here on page 15, we get to see them fly and fight. 
Page 16, uh, the Nazi officer in charge of Ice Station Alpha is called General Hoftmann. Hoftmann in the, is actually the German word for captain. So basically, this guy is General Captain. On this page, we see Batman using a batarang, and uh, we see Chop Chop throwing an axe handle. It was nice to see them use their classic weapons from their respective arsenals. Uh, and on page 17, the explosion of Ice Station Alpha it looks like a mushroom cloud. Uh, now, because the technology used here is so fantastic, it could very well be nuclear powered or atomic powered or just happen to create a similar explosive effect as atomic weapons. Uh, let's see. Final thoughts. Okay. A lot of great Blackhawk and Golden Age Batman tropes are worked into the story. And since I was still new to those versions of the characters, the tropes were still new to me. Uh, I'm sure uh, Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum had a blast making this issue and really showed through on the pages. Um, Dan Adkins inks on this story complemented Dave Cockrum's pencils. Uh, if you recall on the previous episode, uh, uh, episode uh, six, where we covered uh, Star Trek two and three, and then episode four, where we covered Star Trek one from Marvel 1980, uh, both of those, both those three comics and this story were all, were both, were written by Marv Wolfman, penciled by Dave Cockrum. Although Dan Adkins inks in this story were much better suited to Dave Cockrum than the works of, that Klaus Jensen uh, did on the Star Trek story. You know, as I mentioned in those episodes, I didn't think Klaus Jensen was a good fit for Star Trek. Great artist, but sometimes, um, you know, you need an artist just isn't suited for a particular style. And uh, I just don't think the uh, Star Trek was uh, for Klaus Jensen. Uh, let's see. Well, now, uh, Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum, they both love Blackhawk a lot, and they both worked on the Mark Evanier Dan Spiegel series. Uh, Marv Wolfman didn't write any of the stories, but he did serve as editor for several issues, and Dave Cockrum not only drew several of the early covers, he also drew a couple of the interior stories. Uh, Marv Wolfman and Dave Cockrum loved Blackhawk so much that they uh, even created a... a um, feature for Marvel Comics called Sky Wolf, which was basically some version of Blackhawk. Uh, I don't know exactly when they wrote and drew those comics because as uh, uh, far as I know, Marv Wolfman was exclusive to DC from 1980 all the way up through, well, at least 86. But in 1984, uh, the issues of uh, Marvel fanfare, there's a two-part story where uh, that those characters the Skywolf characters appeared. But, you know, if you've never read Blackhawk a lot before, um, this story in Brave and the Bold in 167 was a great introduction to the characters. So, uh, oh, we've got some more feedback um, on YouTube for episode five, where I talked about 1959's The Brave and the Bold, number 28, with the first appearance of the JLA. Uh, Franklin Owen comments, just here to say, I appreciate the time and effort you put into this. Don't give up. You can make it. Thank you very much, Franklin. And I would like to say that the Justice Trek channel is now up to six subscribers. Uh, on Twitter, uh, Ed Moore of Teal Productions and Ross Aitken of the Stop Let's Team Up podcast uh, both retweeted my announcement tweets for episodes four and five. Um and let's see. So thank you very much for those retweets, Ed and Ross. Uh, Ed also asked me on Twitter, uh, are you dropping your show anywhere as an audio only, or is YouTube the only outlet? Well, thanks for that question, Ed. Um, my original plan was, yes, I would be uh, doing audio only versions of the podcast in addition to the uh, YouTube videos. Um, however, um, I haven't done audio versions yet for two reasons. Uh, first, I haven't yet settled on which audio hosting service I might use. Uh, I had previously used Podbean for the audio-only version of Justice Trek, but I'm not sure if I should go back to that. And then the second reason is I um, actually looked into converting uh, the video files to audio versions, and the file size is just too large for any of the uh, free uh, file conversion apps that are around. Um, so the only, and even my, uh, video editing software, it can export the product to, you know, the 1080 HD high quality video, 
or a lower quality video, but it won't convert to audio. So I'm going to, I would have to buy additional uh, software to uh, do that video to audio conversion for these large file sizes. Um, I haven't yet done that. I'm not even sure which uh, would be the best one to use. Uh, so if you have any suggestions for audio hosting services or uh, video to audio conversion software, uh, please let me know. And that's not just to Ed, to any of you listeners, please uh, let me know. And certainly let me know if you want me to do an audio only version. Um, let's see. Oh, and of course I mentioned the previous episodes earlier. Um, episodes one through six are out there covering, uh, uh, comics from the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, uh, and eighties. Um, and, uh, hope you have had a chance to like them and enjoy them. If you haven't seen them yet, by all means, go out there and do it. Uh, you know, I just, another thing I want to just say before I close is next episode, uh, normally I do Trek Tuesday. So every Tuesday is Trek. But because um, they said they wanted our episodes of uh, the JL May crossover to kind of coincide, you know, the issue number with the day of the month. So since I'm covering issue number nine, it will come out on Tuesday, May 9th. So I will not be doing a Trek Tuesday episode. I will be doing a JL May episode. Um, following that... Uh, I will be covering Showcase number 100 from 1978, um, which is the comic that inspired Mar Wolfman to write The Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, and then finally, the week after, or the episode after that, so not this Tuesday, May 9th, but Tuesday, May 16th, I will be covering 2022's Star Trek number 400 from IDW. Um, so, you know, in the intro, of course, I talk about comics throughout comics, interest in comics history, including comics hot off today's shelves. So it's about time I get up to some current comics. And uh, if you haven't yet had a chance to read certainly the, the most recent Star Trek series from IDW written by um, the Jackson Lansing and Colin Kelly, I believe are the writer's names. If you haven't had a chance to read it, by all means, go read it. Uh, I'm going to talk about it, and hopefully, if you haven't read it by the time I talk to you about it, uh, my talking to you about it will convince you to go out and read it. Great comics. Great Star Trek. Uh, really looking forward to getting into those. Uh, so, that's uh, our show. Stick around for the next show, and the follow show after that, and the show after that. Best way to uh, make sure that you always get the latest shows is to click like and subscribe. Thank you for being here. Keep on justice trekking.